Let's expand the binomial theorem as an application of Taylor series. Let's remind ourselves of what the binomial theorem is. It tells us how to expand an expression like that. One plus X to the power of M, where M is a whole number. It says that one plus x to the power of m is some finite polynomial, where the coefficients of the polynomial are m choose k. And let's remind ourselves what m choose k is. It's ordinarily written as m factorial divided by k factorial times m minus k factorial. m choose k is called that because this represents the number of ways it's possible to select k objects from a set of m objects. Here, m and k are, oh, well, I've already said that m is a whole number. K is also a whole number. This equality doesn't make any sense if either M or K are not whole numbers because the factorial is only defined on whole numbers. Let's make the observation, however, that we could rewrite to this. Now M never has a factorial attached to it, and this numerator is defined whatever M is. It would be defined even if M were a negative number, or if M were a fraction or some kind of infinite non-repeating decimal, K still needs to be whole, but for this to be defined, we don't have any restrictions on M. That will bring us neatly into the topic of this lecture, which is whether we can generalize the binomial theorem to work. If instead of having a whole number here, we allow M to be anything. So because we're going to allow M to be anything, these binomial coefficients are going to show up in this situation, but we'll scribble out to this equality and we'll define the binomial coefficients to be this fraction. So our binomial coefficients will be defined even if M is not a whole number. When M is a whole number, 
we get a finite sum. The result of letting m be anything is that we're going to get an infinite series in the place of this finite sum. In particular, let's look at the McLaurin series of one plus x to the power of m. We start with the original function. We take its derivative. We are finding the Taylor coefficient here, and part of finding the Taylor coefficients is knowing the derivatives at zero. If m is not the whole number, we can keep taking these derivatives forever. And more to the point, our derivatives are never going to turn to zero. Let me finish writing this, and then let me expand on that. Suppose m were two, then this, after we take the second derivative, is the zero power. One plus x to the power of zero is one. The second derivative is constant, and the third derivative is zero. And the third derivative evaluated at zero will therefore be zero. But m isn't two. We're assuming that m is not a whole number. So that will never happen. We keep taking these derivatives. And we keep getting non zero numbers when we plug zero in to the derivative. And if you look for the pattern, the first derivative, we have m minus zero. The second derivative, we have m minus zero and m minus one. The third derivative, we have m minus zero, m minus one, m minus two. The nth derivative, well, we start with m and we count down m minus one, m minus two. And you know, one is two minus one, two is three minus one. We count down. to n minus one. And these are what the derivatives look like at zero. These are not the Taylor coefficients. The Taylor coefficients have factorials in them. The Taylor coefficients are simply the binomial coefficients. As long as we define m choose k appropriately,
exactly so that M does not have to be a whole number. The Taylor series then is the same as the sum we got from the binomial theorem, except we don't have a terminating condition here. We have an infinite series. Now, unfortunately, I don't expect this Taylor series to converge everywhere. Why not? Well, let's assume for the moment that one plus x to the power of m does equal its Taylor series. So, for example, we have this equality. Well, this is the square root of one over X. If X equals negative two, this square root is the imaginary unit I. And it hardly makes sense to me that we can add an infinite number of real numbers together and get the imaginary unit i back again. I think it's much more likely that this series doesn't converge at x equals 2. If we apply the ratio test to find the radius of convergence, almost everything cancels, like this M and this M cancel. In fact, all of these are going to cancel with terms up here. The only thing that will survive in the numerators is this M minus K. As for the factorials, k plus one factorial is k plus one times k factorial, and these factorials will cancel. The ratio ends up simplifying to that. Now you take the limit as k goes to infinity. And as you take this limit, you're treating m as a constant, you're treating x as a constant. If it's k that we're treating as a variable, this then is a rational function. And it has a horizontal asymptote at negative one, but the absolute value will get rid of any negative signs. And this limit is the absolute value of X. So this Taylor series converges absolutely when the absolute value of X is less than one. And although I won't prove it, it is true that when the Taylor series converges, one plus X to the power of M equals its Taylor series.